So, weldment fracture mechanics is my topic. It is dedicated to my father. And coincidentally, as you can see, he uh, passed away the same year as Professor Lazarin. I didn't know that until recently. I have many slides, but I will go fast through them. There is actually a content here comprising six different uh, topics which illustrate achievements in uh, well in welding uh, sorry weldment fracture mechanics ever since we started testing uh, penstock prototype back in 1975 then some achievements through usa xu projects uh, uh, then leakage of spherical storage tanks then about uh, more or less fatigue in uh, two following uh, topics. And finally, micromechanical modeling, which strongly resembles to what uh, Filippo just presented. So uh, this is now a legendary prototype. We have uh, tested it a uh, long time ago, but we still work on it in a sense of uh, simulating its behavior i will present now just uh, what was done uh, during the testing time and that was a very large project which uh, led to construction of a reversible hydropower plant by nabashta which is one of three largest in the world so this is the most critical segment of the pipeline uh, there are some uh, very heavy weldments to say because of the thickness, 47 millimeters. It was, and even that thickness was not satisfying uh, safety factors. So, uh, actually, the point here was to prove that design with the reduced safety factor is still good enough. Uh, Therefore, extensive testing, whatever we could do at that time was done, uh, was uh, intended, uh, was, was performed to prove fitness for purpose. Uh, that included mechanical properties, all of them, of course, of LD joints, also instrumented Sharpie tests. The next presentation, you will hear many interesting and intriguing details about Sharpie test. Then transition temperature, which is practically once again Sharpie test. Drop weight test, once again for transition temperature. And uh, of course, fracture mechanics parameters, fracture toughness, J integral, COD, all of them, CTOD, and the crack was positioned uh, in all uh, zones of uh, weldment, be it uh, base metal, weld metal, or heat affected zone. We also had uh, instrumentation comprising of strain gauges, crack opening displacement gauge, acoustic emission sensor, and moire grid. And you can also see here on the disposition of these measuring points and also disposition disposition of the uh, specimens samples that were taken out to make uh, uh, specimens uh, <coughs> i will now just present uh, briefly one of the most important and interesting results it was uh, measuring by strain gauges of uh, certain uh, most critical of course welded joints and the number 34 was and still is intriguing because of this uh, uncharacteristic loop but i will not go into details for that what i want you now to notice is that there is not a very big but a very it's actually very small but there is a plastic strain here and that is uh, something that a bit surprised us uh, because we did not expect it but when we added uh, overpressure in order to make uh, uh, testing as according to standards 
and uh, having in mind stress concentration and also having in mind uh, undermatched welded joints, then afterwards we concluded it was not that surprising at all. Anyhow, we did make two very important conclusions. One is that prototype proved safe operation and designed with reduced safety factor. Uh, the other one also important that 30% of overloading produced small plastic strain, as I just explained. Uh, from one point of view, uh, this means that 30% uh, of overloading is too much. Maybe overloading is a bad idea actually from the very beginning, but other aspect of uh, this uh, problem is that uh, steel which was used to build this uh, uh, pipeline is uh, uh, ductile enough, it has a, a reserve of plasticity which can uh, sustain this small strain without any uh, damage. So this was the first one. Second one, USA XU project, you can see three key researchers, three key persons here in photos. As already shown, they read in Stan Sednak, but also Stan Sednak and Blagoj Petrovsky. I'm not quite sure about the third one, which is backwards, but it could have been me. Maybe Blagoj can <laughs> say he is right here with us. Mohan Ratswani? Maybe. <laughs> okay, we'll discuss it later. Anyhow, a large number of extensive experiments were performed, and that is uh, especially during Blagoj Petrovsky's stay in, in, in NIST, in Boulder. It is a, uh, a zillions of experimental results. Some of them we are even now uh, trying to simulate in uh, using finite elements. Uh, but most important in this project, at least to, from my point of view, is application of J integral, which was used for as a direct measured quantity, but but encompassing uh, welded joint, which uh, uh, means that uh, basic definition of J integral as a conservation law is a bit jeopardized. Uh, actually, according to strict theory, J integral is not path independent if it, it if the path crosses well the joint because then we have heterogeneous material. Therefore, we uh, made uh, theoretical and numerical analysis. It was a long time ago, so these sketches are from about 40 years old. Nowadays, it would look like a very nice, colorful, uh, stress strain figures, but this is also completely correct. You can see here, for example, values for J integral and the proof that it is a bit dependent on the path. But then again, once we summarized all our results, we came to the final conclusion that the effect is negligible unless base metals are different. So if we have maybe combination ferrite to astenite, then in that case, we really have to take it to account. But in this case, we actually proved the val validity of results of uh, experimental direct measurement of J integral. And this is how it is done. Uh, there is a lot of instrumentation on tensile panels. It is a relatively simple task as compared to the pressure vessels. In that case, we had to take out a patch and then re-weld it. And that was with the purpose to instrument pressure vessel with uh, strain gauges and to follow strains as they develop during pressurizing. Now, here, some other aspects were also taken into account by axial stress state and curvature, but none of it uh, produced uh, much discrepancies in a theoretical sense. So from practical point of view, we were able to apply J integral as crack driving force. The, those are here the curves. Uh, 
0 0.9 means ratio between applied stress and uh, yield strength. And those crack driving force which are calculated are then compared with the JR curves which were experimentally obtained. Uh, that comparison enabled us, for example, to, to find one critical point, let's say it is point T, which uh, predicts that uh, after stable uh, part of uh, crack growth, after stable crack growth, uh, if loading uh, reaches approximately 85% of field strength, unstable crack growth would follow. So that is a kind of a critical point. And that was for a crack which is 60%, uh, which is uh, uh, the crack with length, which is 60% of the depth. So that is actually very big crack, which one cannot overlook by NDT. Uh, so, that was the uh, second topic. We move to the third one. It is also back in 80s, a very important and difficult uh, practical problem about leakage of spherical storage tanks. It was the first uh, generation of uh, uh, high strength steels. Uh, well, a bit of a micro alloy with, with uh, some vanadium and but uh, most important is that uh, production technology was not as good as today and that co uh, carbon content was uh, a bit uh, higher than today so that steel was susceptible to cracking although certainly weldable and certainly not problematic if uh, welding procedure specification is followed strictly. Now, in real life, it happens from time to time that uh, welders do not follow instructions, they do not dry electrodes, for example, so hydrogen cracking was not an uncommon problem in, in this uh, type of steel and this type of uh, construction. Uh, uh, more concretely, one storage tank that was analyzed, the data is given here, and uh, we apply the same procedure and uh, methodology just described. So we used J integral on one hand side as uh, crack driving force, on the other hand side as fracture toughness. In the case of crack driving force, we used the so-called King's model, at that time, that was the best option. Nowadays, probably nobody remembers that model, but I think it's still usable for simple geometries like uh, spherical tank really is. Nevertheless, uh, here is JR curve that we obtained by uh, using CT specimens. And once again, here is this plot of crack driving force versus uh, JR curves, indicating that even 95% of uh, yield strength uh, will not make uh, crack grow. And the initial crack length is about 20% uh, of uh, thickness. So this is once again quite a large crack which cannot be overlooked by NDT. And also stresses like that are not definitely ex expected unless significant or overload is applied. So once again, our conclusion, or at least my conclusion, is that uh, waterproof uh, is not a sound idea. It actually, waterproof testing, it actually proves nothing, but on the other hand side, it can make a lot of uh, harm. So the next topic, we now shift to fatigue. It is. Uh, uh, crack resistance and fatigue crack growth parameters, which we tested. It was done in the, our military technical institute in, in Zharkovo, and the uh, object of testing uh, was uh, this uh, nice bridge, we call it Gazella, because of the shape. But after 
about 40 years of exploitation, large cracks were discovered. You can see some of them here. So something had to be uh, done. And that was uh, in, in the scope of the whole experimental uh, procedure applied, that was uh, dynamic loading. First, for standard specimens without crack, so that SN curves were obtained. It was done both for base metal and for welded joint. You can see here that uh, fatigue strength uh, for base metal is 217, which is relatively high for this type of steel with yield strength of about uh, 355. But we are more interesting now in fracture mechanics parameters. Uh, K1C was measured via J1C. So according to ASTM E1820 standard, this was done and results were uh, classified in two directions. And then finally, fatigue crack growth. We still didn't uh, uh, get into that topic, so I will now keep your attention for a minute or two. Uh, this is a simple laboratory equipment as used in Zharkovo. Our co-worker Ziyah Burzic is in charge of that, one of Stoyan's students. You can see here sharp specimen that's very important to, to emphasize, which was which is used in this uh, equipment called Fractomat, uh, with monitoring, thanks to this small device, monitoring of crack growth. So in this way, we can get curves like these two shown here. Uh, you can see that uh, typically they have three different ranges. Uh, we are interested mostly in this linear part of the curve because that is actually Paris law. And knowing that by some uh, simple mathematical operations uh, and procedure, we can get coefficients C and M so that we can define uh, fatigue crack growth rate. Results of this procedure are, are given here. This is according to standard uh, ISTM E647 and also prediction for a crack to grow from 620 millimeters to 924 millimeters under amplitude loading on 20 megapascals. Prediction for number of cycles is close to a million. And then for uh, amplitude loading of 10 megapascals, uh, prediction is close to 14 millions. Maybe it looks like large number, but uh, if frequency is uh, one hertz, you will get a very, very short period of time. So uh, the state of the steel supporting structure was quite critical. Nevertheless, it was reconstructed and, and repaired. Next topic is aeronautical uh, component, which is used in a fuselage assembly. Uh, this is a panel, aluminum alloy panel with uh, stringers. You can see them, four of them here, and the crack uh, artificially positioned in the middle, in the central part. So these Panels were tested and then numerically simulated. Once again, Blagoj Petrovsky is the man who did testing. We can see here some results for two different alloys. We can see this linear part of a uh, uh, curve which corresponds to Paris law. So this is how we uh, determine the coefficients C and M, and then we use these coefficients to numerically simulate a panel 
in the first phase, uh, that uh, simulation was just for a panel without stringers so that we verify our numerical procedure. These two curves actually show that uh, numerical simulation is uh, uh, acceptable, a difference is not uh, too uh, big, and also our numerical procedure tend to be conservative. So from both points of view, we were satisfied and continued our work for the panel with stringers, and then we got some very interesting results. Namely, you can see here that after 68 uh, step of fatigue crack growth, which is approximately, I think, one millimeter per step, the crack reaches these two panels, left and right of it. Then it goes through the panel, but not only through the base panel, also it goes through the stringer. In, you can see that after 78 step, it is partly uh, already up through the stringer, and then after 130th step, it is almost through the stringers, both left and right, and after 160th step, uh, well, some asymmetry appeared, but anyhow, you can see here that a crack went all the way through the stringers, and that proves that stringers really contribute a lot to a uh, number of cycles. Also, of course, our numerical results proved that, but we could visualize the process and uh, find out uh, uh, why it happened. So it is something like when you go for micromechanical investigation to, to check what's going on in microscopic world. And finally, the last topic is this micromechanical modeling. Uh, it is, in this case, about ductile failure with fracture, which uh, for metallic materials is typical in uh, three phases, void nucleation, void growth, and void coalescence. This was first uh, simulated or, or uh, described by Rice, uh, Rice Tracy equation. I have to say that uh, whatever I did in fracture mechanics, it was always Jim Rice who did it uh, first. Not only J integral, but about four or five different topics as well. Uh, Micromechanical modeling uh, is a very versatile numerical tool to follow crack initiation and growth, but of course, some material parameter has to be built in the model, and they are to be determined experimentally. As you can see here, this is the void volume fraction, and this is uh, a mean, mean distance between them. And this lambda parameter is very important. You will see uh, that uh, meshes we later used for uh, simulating this uh, uh, process depend strongly on lambda. Actually, it should not, but it does. We still can't solve that problem. Uh, anyhow, what I'm showing you, what I will show you is so-called complete Gerson model as developed by Julian Zheng. And once again, I thank him for allowing us to use numerical uh, subroutines that he developed. And here is what was uh, done. It was in Abacus and uh, by using that subroutine I just mentioned, we simulated 2D and 3D problem. You can see here what it is about. Of course, in both cases, it is a welded joint. And we, in both cases, also uh, had uh, two different crack positions, one in heat affected zone, the other in weld metal. Uh, so here you can see uh, also some results. You can see that uh, first, uh, uh, analysis indicated uh, uh, first uh, experimental analysis indicated uh, provided us with uh, uh, J critical values, and then we tried to simulate that both with 2D and 3D model. 
as you can see here, this uh, problem of finite element size is already mentioned here, but at least we know that uh, elements uh, surrounding crack should be of the size equal to the uh, mean distance between inclusions. So we use it and don't excuse it, and somebody will probably explain once what's going on there. Now you can see some results on the way to get this uh, comparison, which is very important. And it indicates that uh, complete Gerson model, which predicts in uh, J uh, critical. So for the initiation, uh, comparisons are 57.6 versus 64.7 then 121 versus 84, uh, good enough in both cases, and even better in case of uh, tensor panel. Uh, the first two were for uh, single edge notch beam specimen that was in two dimension, three, tensor panel was in three dimension, and for that we really got excellent agreement, 114.7 uh, versus 125.1 and 346.2 versus 321.4. Having in mind that those were the first results for developments and their different uh, zones, we were really satisfied with these results. And although I have a few more slides, I will stop now and conclude that uh, development structure mechanics as developed in, in ex-Yugoslavia and Serbia uh, has uh, grown from uh, very important uh, experimental results at the beginning to our capability to numerically simulate uh, initiation and growth of crack, not only in uh, specimens, but also in components. So thank you for your attention. And if any questions, please pose them. Sasha, thank you very much for presenting and uh, reviewing what uh, are we doing, our group for Fracture, what are we dealing with? So it was a very nice uh, presentation. Thank you for that. Thank Showing you. To, to others, what are we dealing with? Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Robitsa.